And I sat there, and after about an hour, there's this little voice in the back of my head saying, surrender. I wrestled with that for about 10 minutes. Surrender to what? And then this other voice saying, you know, trust. Trust in what? Trust in whom? And eventually, the answer that came to me was just surrender to the jungle. And then the next question was like, what the hell does that mean? Finally, the answer came, just lie down. I was in a t-shirt. And this is the Amazon jungle. And this particular area was one of the most biodiverse parts of the Amazon jungle with lots of really, really gnarly insects, including what's called the bullet ant, which is the most painful bite of any creature on Earth. Every instinct was like, that is the craziest idea in the world. You're going to get overrun with bullet ants and you're going to die from banana spiders. And the voice just kept coming and it kept just saying trust and surrender. I laid down on the forest floor for half an hour in my T-shirt. I just sank into that experience. I actually felt myself at one point just merge with the forest around me as if there wasn't any separation between. It was somewhat akin to a psychedelic experience, minus the psychedelics. Welcome to the Seven Hats Podcast. My name is Yuval Selig, and I've been on the entrepreneurial roller coaster for over 20 years. I've experienced it all throughout my journey, the grind, burnout, failure, and ultimately, success. The turning point for me was realizing that building a successful company is meaningless if you neglect the other significant areas of your life. So today, I'm inviting you to join me on an adventure through those seven areas, what I call the seven hats. Every week, my guests and I will drop valuable insights and pearls of wisdom, helping, motivating, and inspiring you to get your seven hats in order and deliver real impact with meaning. So let's get going. Welcome, Seven Hatters. Prepare yourself for an episode overflowing with enriching wisdom as we dive into a conversation with Mike Brissick, an adventurer, entrepreneur, and much more, dissecting the intricacies of his dynamic life and exploring hats one, three, four, and seven, the soul, servant, entrepreneur, and the seeker. Mike is a formidable force in the realm of social entrepreneurship and impactful business, with a diverse career spanning numerous roles and industries. Currently, he is captivating hearts worldwide as the founder and chief explorer of Wayfinders, fostering connections and cultivating a sense of belonging among people. Numerous individuals and entrepreneurs, weary of feeling disconnected, adrift, and burnt out, have found solace and purpose in Mike's initiatives having personally experienced the transformative power of a shift from ego-driven pursuits to selfless service. Mike is well-versed in the healing potential of human connection and the communal experience. Having run the world's number one mountain bike adventure company, Sacred Rides, for 22 years and served in multiple social entrepreneurial roles, such as the Dean of Social Enterprise and the Center for Social Innovation, Mike's insights are a compelling mix of inspiration and actionable takeaways. So if you're ready to travel the path from ego-based striving to a life of service, foster deep connections, and evolve into the entrepreneur who thrives on creating positive social impact, let's welcome Mike to The Seven Hats. Mike, welcome to The Seven Hats. Good to see you, Val. I'm excited. Oh, listen, I can't hide my excitement about this episode, it will hit, I think, all the right notes for our adventurous listeners out there. Being an entrepreneur is already a crazy ride, but when you mix in community and a dose of high-octane fun, it's something else. So whether you're an entrepreneur from Toronto or from Timbuktu, get ready, you're about to jump into a whirlwind tour of business, adventure, and above all, I think, community. But Before we start and dive into this round-the-world trip of yours, the Seven Hatters would love to hear your own story, I think. So it's your turn to start. Where were you born and how was your childhood like? So I I was born in Toronto, Canada, child of two recent immigrants from Croatia or Yugoslavia, as it was called back then. I mean, that's such a complicated question, and I've spent a lot of my adult life trying to unravel that that question and understand, you know, what are the influences that got me here and what are the pivotal moments that shaped me? I think one of those is definitely growing up as an only child Hmm. and growing up as a bit of, I guess, a bit of an awkward child and 
the son of immigrants and spending a lot of time in kind of more waspy type communities where I was seen as a little bit of an outsider. And I think, you know, my, and, and just through the work that I've done as an adult to explore myself and uncover who I am, you know, one of the things I uncovered was just this real pervasive sense through childhood of not quite fitting in anywhere or not feeling like I belonged anywhere, including a lot of the time in my own home. And, and that, that sense of alienation and disconnection definitely informs my work today, a lot of which is helping, to, helping people restore connection in their own lives and in all its, in all its various facets. You know, the other, the other seminal moment from my childhood was my father developing brain cancer when I was 14 and then passing away when I was 16. And, and that left a you know, pretty big wound that uh, I tried to run away from for many years. But, you know, that eventually caught up to me in my, in my mid-30s where I was forced to deal with that, you know, the grief and the pain that I just kind of spent most of my 20s running away from. But all, all of those experiences, and I was just reflecting on this today, actually, in the context of my own children and how sometimes parents, you know, we, th- we think it's our job to raise, you know, happy kids in a, in a warm, welcoming, loving household. And, and I definitely agree with that. But I also don't agree that it's our job to just shelter them from, you know, adverse, adverse experiences. And if I look back on some of the most difficult moments of my life, they were undoubtedly what shaped who I am today, brought me to my current place, and I'm, and I'm deeply grateful for them. And I can even say, you know, I definitely wish my dad hadn't passed away, but I'm deeply grateful for the time I spent with him. I'm, I'm also grateful for the wound that left, and, and because that left a real appreciation for, you know, the connections that I do have in my lives and, and why that's that pretty much the, my number one focus in life is, is my relationships and the connections that I have. So all of that has shaped who I am today, and I'm, I'm grateful for all, all the heartache that was, you know, along the way as well. Yeah, it's so difficult to lose a parent in general, no matter what age you're at. But losing a parent when you're young is really difficult. Why did the pain come up in, in your 40s? What was the catalyst for that experience? Well, it was, it was actually in my 30s, my early 30s. You know, as a 16-year-old, life's confusing enough, let alone having to deal with a sick parent who then who then passed away. I didn't I didn't know how to how to grieve that. I I I didn't even want to grieve it. And so, you know, the day that my dad died, I just went and played baseball with my friends and and didn't want to think about that. And I didn't want to think about it through my team, through university. In my twenties, I just moved out west and and decided I wanted to become a ski bum and just and I tried to out ski and out party. You know, this 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 core wound inside. It wasn't until I was thirty four. And, you know, in a nutshell, my, the, the woman that I was seeing at the time dumped me. And that sent me into a two and a half, two and a half year spiral, uh, what I call, you know, my long, dark night of the soul. It was a pretty deep depression. It wasn't, it wasn't because of her. We'd only been dating a few weeks. It was because that loss triggered that, that sense of loss that I'd never dealt with at my core. And that led me to some dark places, but also led me to some wonderful places, including you know, discovering an incredible therapist who kind of brought me under his wing and who also welcomed me into this incredible group therapy process, which still to this day, you know, I, I look at the process of personal growth or therapy is so much more powerful when it's done within the context of a community. And we tend to look at personal growth as a very personal journey, as a solo journey. But, and there are aspects to it, of course, that are very individual and solo, but I, I think of it as uh, and I see it as much more powerful when it's w- within the context of other people going on similar journeys with you. And so that that experience, that that d- two and a half year long depression, as hard as it was, and it was there was days that were you know just agonizing. I am I am so grateful for that experience now, and I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm so grateful for it. It gave me a completely different perspective on life. It helped me develop empathy. It helped me really widen the this, this, this scope and breadth of emotions that I can feel. It, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, it just cracked me right open. It's interesting that when a parent passes away, and I've seen this with a friend of mine who committed suicide and left a young kid fatherless, the moments, the weeks and months after his death, 
the kid was completely normal, happy child. It was almost like his dad was still there. And I'm sure it's just a coping mechanism. And that kid will probably have to go through what you went through over time, because it's, I think it's hard to process when you're so young, the loss. How did your mom deal with it? And what was that like at home as she was raising you? Yeah, no doubt it was extremely difficult for her. She had to, you know, now she, she never actually really wanted to come to Canada. And my dad, my dad convinced her. You know, the way she's told the story, he convinced her that it would be a five-year experiment and he convinced her to commit to five years. And if they, you know, if she didn't like it after five years, they would move back to Yugoslavia. I don't know, you know, if that five-year conversation ever happened or anything like that, but she didn't want to, she didn't want to come to Canada in the first place. She didn't, she didn't speak any English. And then she was just starting her career as a lawyer and she came to Canada and they landed, you know, they landed at Toronto Airport and went to see the customs person. He asked her what her occupation was. And she said, I'm a lawyer. And he said, he said, in his not very elegant way, well, you're not a lawyer anymore. You're a homemaker now, mm. which I think was maybe his inelegant way of saying that your law degree, you know, you kind of have to start over here. Uh, so it was, a, it was a big blow for her. And she had to learn English. She went back to university and got two more, two master's degrees and eventually kind of found her way. But Never really, I don't think, accepted Canada. And then to then, you know, be faced with raising a, a teenager on her own, trying to navigate life on her own was extremely difficult. And, you know, as a teenager, you, most teenagers tend to distance themselves from their parents anyway. But then when you lose one of your parents and then my wife has, you know, lost her husband and then her child is distancing himself from her and she she knows that he's, you know, probably struggling with the loss of his parent and feels a little bit powerless. It was it was definitely a struggle. And then, you know, I, I I did the diligent thing and went to university just for lack of anything better to do, I guess, at at the time. But I graduated university yeah. and I knew I didn't want to work in my field, which was economics and history. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do with those degrees. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, amazing. And uh, and so the day after my last exam, I packed up my, my Volvo station wagon and I drove out to the mountains. And I just said, you know, I'm going to be a ski bum for a year and then I'll figure out what I'm going to do after that. And I think she really struggled to her. That felt like I was abandoning her. But I just needed to find my own way in the world. About four months after landing in this little ski town in the Rockies, after I'd been fired from my third straight job, I, I took a hard look in the mirror and decided I'm not a very good employee. You know, maybe maybe I just need to start my own business. Within a couple of months of that, I started my first business. And that was the beginning of a 27-year, now 27-year journey through entrepreneurship that, um, you know, the, th the thought of doing anything else is almost inconceivable to me. I, I, I don't think I'd be capable. I wouldn't be able to work for somebody else. And so yeah. I, stay on the, I stay on this path and I'm blessed that I've found work that truly feels like a calling and it's aligned with every, you know, all of my experience, all my skills, all my passions, all, all my desires for service in the world. I count my blessings every day. We're a special breed, us entrepreneurs. You put us in a corporate environment and we just close up. It's a difficult time for us. So did you have any dreams while you were in high school and college of becoming an entrepreneur? Or did you think you're going to just work as a corporate accountant or an economist? What were your desires growing up? You know, to be honest, I, I don't think I had any idea what I was going to do. I know growing up, I wanted to be a baseball player. Uh, but I think, I'd, you know, at some point I realized, geez, you got to put in a lot of work to be a professional baseball player and the odds are pretty low. I don't think I thought much beyond the path that was laid out for me and, uh, or, being, or being laid out for me. And so, you know, I graduated high school and I, I went into engineering at the University of Toronto for half a year just because my dad was an engineer and I liked math. And uh, after three months of that, it's like, okay, this is, not, this is not the right place for me. And so I, I transferred just to a general arts and science degree the next year. But then partway through that year, through various experiments with, uh, let's say, illicit substances, mind-expanding ones, <laughs> nice. I... I discovered, well, along with a couple of friends, that we wanted to actually travel. Ended up 
working for a little while to save up some money. And then we traveled through Southeast Asia, my girlfriend and my friend and I, for six months. And, wow. and that was a really, and that was 1991, 1992. And before, before you know, Southeast Asia travel had become a big thing, you know, back then, it's a thing to backpack through Europe. And so that was such a mind, mind-opening experience at the age of 20 to encounter these, you know, completely foreign cultures and completely different ways of living life. And it's pretty easy now to, you know, draw a straight line from that experience to what is now a 20, you know, 27 year career in the world of travel and adventure travel and stuff like that. But there, there was one experience on that, on that trip that kind of w- was, I guess, the, the seeds of entrepreneurship. My girlfriend and I landed in Southeast Asia in December of 1991 with $3,500 Canadian in our pocket and a, and a ticket home six months later out of Amsterdam. And so wow. we had to figure out how we're going to make $3,500 last for six months for two people. And we, 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 we did, or we almost did, uh, because Southeast <laughs> Asia, even now, it's quite cheap. But back then, it was ridiculously yeah. cheap. Anyway, so we, we were facing our last two weeks in Asia. We were in Nepal. And we had about uh, a week and a half left in Nepal and a little bit of time in India. And we were down to our last $400. And we had a flight from New Delhi to Amsterdam. And then we had a month in Amsterdam. And uh, we're looking at our money and thinking, hmm, this goes a long way in Southeast Asia. I don't know if $400 is going <laughs> to cut it for a month in Amsterdam. Yes. Yeah. And we'd, we'd already hit my mom up for money. Couldn't really, couldn't really do that again. We couldn't hit up her parents for money. In Kathmandu at the time, and probably still to this day, there was these, all these vendors along um, kind of the, the main street that were selling these beautiful embroidered T-shirts. And they had like these beautiful mandala patterns and all these, you know, wonderful patterns. And they were about a dollar a piece, a uh, dollar to two dollars. And, and I looked at them, I thought, geez, like, pretty sure people in Amsterdam would pay more than a dollar for those shirts. And so I convinced my girlfriend to use 300 of our last $400 to fill up two duffel bags with uh, embroidered T-shirts, and I, and I walked around from shop to shop negotiating. You know how much how much for 200 shirts or you know whatever we were paying, and got the best price I could. And then they had a week to get them all ready. And a week later, we picked up two giant duffel bags of T-shirts, flew to Amsterdam with them, and then there's this giant park in Amsterdam called Vondel Park, and it's kind of like Central Park, you know, this big park. And on Sundays in Vondel Park, back then, maybe to this day, uh, it's like a giant garage sale people you can just sell whatever you want including you know space cake and marijuana or whatever and you don't need a permit nobody's going to hassle you so we went there two days after we landed and i think our first day we made about twelve hundred dollars selling these shirts for i think about fifteen dollars a piece or something like that wow and then we managed to get ourselves a nice apartment in amsterdam we kind of lived it up after you know five months of really dirtbagging it around southeast asia that was kind of the first time like i took i took an entrepreneurial risk and it and it paid off and it sort of primed me for a lifetime of just, you know, realizing that sometimes you got to take risks and they may not all pan out. But, you, you know, if you want to live a rewarding life, you have to take some risks. That's amazing. That's an incredible story. So from Amsterdam to Sacred Rites, what was that journey like? Well, so now, now we're going back to this little ski town in the Rockies. I've, I've gotten fired from my first three jobs. It's a town of 6,000 people. So it didn't take much to imagine that it was going to be hard to find another job because probably, you know, word, word got around, but this guy who didn't like working for other people. And, uh, and I was walking along, along, there's this trail along the river there, and I was walking there with a, a buddy. And, and, and actually, that, that, that same friend is now coming with me to my Mongolia event in October as my co-facilitator. Uh, so it's been quite a journey since those first days. But I was chatting with him and saying, geez, I, I just got fired from my third job in three months. Like, what the hell am I going to do now? He said, well, you know, you, like there's, you love mountain biking and there's all these amazing mountain bike trails around town. And they're, they're kind of hard to find. There's tourists around. Like maybe you can take people, you know, guide them around the local trails. And I, th- and I thought about that for a day. And I thought, that's a, that's a great idea. I managed to convince another friend to join me as my business partner. He ended up leaving about four years later uh, to become a chiropractor. But we got a, a $10,000 loan from an organization called Community Futures Development Corporation. Mm-hmm. We we bought a small fleet of um, mountain bikes to rent out, and I we didn't have enough. This was 1996. We didn't have enough money to hire. This was the the dawn of the internet, and I knew that like I I could sense that this internet thing was probably going to catch on, and I knew that it would be useful to have a web page, but there there weren't that many 
you know, back then it's like you, you, there was no Squarespace or all these, you know, wonderful tools yep. you can do it yourself. You had to hand code your websites. And so I, I tried to find some web designers and they were all really, really expensive, like way more money than we could afford. And then I, there was a guy at the local who ran Fernie Tourism who was really skilled in, in Photoshop and Dreamweaver, which is like a, a web design kind of. And I said, hey, listen, if I, sh if I volunteer for you one day a week, will you teach me how to use Photoshop and Dreamweaver? And he did that, and you know, maybe two months later, I designed our first brochure and and did our website and got our website live. Our first year, we only had we, we had one customer, <laughs> and I mean, we rented bikes out, but we only had one customer for guiding. But yeah. um, I think I think we like rock paper scissors for who would who would take them out, and I won, and I took them out. <laughs> and this, I think he paid us like eighty dollars or something for the day. But I had this big shit-eating grin on my face, and I could not believe that somebody was actually paying me to go mountain biking. And I was like, this is, this is the dream. And then, you know, we didn't get another customer all summer. By year three, we started launching overnight trips, and that's where, that's where things really took off. And we got featured in Outside Magazine and a bunch of other magazines. And, um, and then it was around our, and, and it, the company steadily grew for about seven years, mainly focused on British Columbia, but in year 10, I started expanding internationally trips to Peru and Switzerland. And, you know, by the time I left the company or sold the company, we were in 45 countries around the world. Wow. I had a big team and, and it had become, you know, it had become a big business by then. So there are many lessons learned as a first time founder. Any notable insights that you can share with the seven headers? Well, I, I mean, these are, these are lessons that I've learned many times along the way. And probably my my number one lesson, at least one that I try and take to heart, but I also try, like I, I, I used to run startup boot camps for startup entrepreneurs for many years. And one of the things I would just hammer home, home to them is that the world doesn't give a rat's ass about your idea because people would typically come into this with an idea. And I said, you know, what the world cares about, what customers care about is having their problems solved and having them solved, you know, elegantly and, and well. And so I'd, I would tell them, like, get your head out of your ass. It's not about your idea. Go and talk to your potential customers, your customers. And so the first couple of classes were really all about just understanding the customer and the problem and how to conduct. A, uh, I had this process for conducting customer interviews. And it was like really about getting to know people, getting to know the, the problem and how you can solve that problem for, for people. And then, then you can go about developing the solution. But if you start with the solution, you're typically starting with an assumption that you know what the problem is, that you know the customer, that you know how they want the problem solved. And I, you know, to this day, you know, I just actually, just before this, just got in from having lunch with one of my members. And I, like any given week, I'm probably having at least five calls, a couple of coffees, maybe a lunch or two with my members. Uh, a, because I love hanging out with them. B, because I want to find out about their lives and what's going on and what's keeping them up at night and what are their hopes and dreams, stuff like that. And then C, because then, you know, then I can bounce ideas uh, off them for like what would be valuable to them. So one of the last things we talked about at this lunch is said, you know, in the context of this community, you're part of like what would, what would be really valuable to you? And he gave me some ideas that, you know, that now go in a notepad and they're on our kind of development thing. So, and, and even in my last company with Sacred Rides, uh, it was, you know, it was quite a large company with, you know, thousands of customers and a big team, but I still prioritized talking to our customers. And so whenever somebody signed up for one of our trips, they, a couple of days later, they would get an automated email saying, hey, it's Mike, the owner of Sacred Rides. Uh, if you're game, I'd love to hop on a 15-minute call with you. And there was a link to book a call. And, uh, and I only had five slots available per week. I didn't want to overwhelm my week, but every week I would talk to five customers and, and I would ask them questions like, you know, why did you sign up for this trip? Like, what's, uh, tell me what's going on with your life. And sometimes it was, sometimes the answer was just like, I've always wanted to go to Switzerland or something like that. But more often than not, the answer was like, you know, I've just, I've just gone through a painful divorce and I need, I just need to go somewhere and have fun or, you know, or, or some major life event. And they just wanted to go somewhere, you know, far away and they wanted to have fun or they wanted to spend time with other people or whatever. And when you understand your customers at that level, at that deep, you know, core emotional level, you, you learn how to create products and services that better serve them, and you learn how to speak to them in a language that resonates. And so to this day, that's my number one, you know, lesson in business is get to know your customers, get to know their problems, and then orient your whole business around 
uh, service and, and around providing value to them. And so that's, that's what I do with Wayfinders. I do virtually zero marketing. And like my events sell out, you know, 18 months in advance. Uh, sometimes because I've, the, vo- the focus is squarely on providing value. Wow. I mean, that's such a poignant insight, I think, for any entrepreneur, because as you first start your business, you have a product that you believe in, your baby, and your baby is never ugly for any entrepreneur until it becomes ugly when you when the consumer nobody else likes resonate. your baby <laughs> nobody else likes your baby and it's a big i mean i think every entrepreneur goes through that multiple times but the great entrepreneurs out there are the ones that don't take it personally and reach out to their customer base and figure out how do i make my baby prettier mm-hmm. and and it's possible and and they're willing to listen and they're willing to they're willing to be flexible and, and not be, you know, wedded to their idea. And, I, I sure. you know, from the hundreds of entrepreneurs that went through my boot camps, I would say, and, and most of these were people who came in at the idea phase. You know, it was pre-revenue, pre, pre-anything. I would say at least three quarters, if not more of them, their eventual business didn't really resemble the initial idea that much at all. It yeah. was, you know, it was related but it was, it, it was typically there was some sort of significant pivot along the way. And so, you know, it's great to start with an idea. But if you start with this is a problem I see in the world and I want to solve it and I want to solve it better than anybody else yeah. can because I'm willing to put in the time to understand these people and their problems. And I want to solve this problem because it's, it's meaningful to me. If you latch onto a, a problem in a customer base that resonates with you, that you, you know, that you want to create value for, that will sustain you through a lot of difficult days and nights, right? Because they always come as an entrepreneur. Absolutely. So you have a successful business. Why leave? Why sell? Well, uh, I eventually got to the point where I realized that I'd outgrown that business. You know, I started that business when I was... 24 and it was it was based on my love of mountain biking and then later became based on my love of travel Th- those were those were great but uh, I kind of felt I was ready for a new phase in my life and a, and a new approach of being of service I'd also created this big kind of lumbering beast of a business that had a lot of staff had a lot of shareholders had a lot of spreadsheets <laughs> you know I went in my early days I wore a lot of hats, m- many more than seven hats, I can tell you. And uh, I was, the, you know, I was the head driver. I was the lead guide. I was the assistant guide. I was the cook. I was the marketing person, salesperson, you know. And I would spend, you know, some of those years, I would spend 80, 90 days on my bike guiding. And it was really hard work because, you know, you'd finish a week-long trip. And then often we'd be dropping off one group at the airport and we'd have an hour to kill. And then we'd pick up the next group coming in to the airport at the same time. And it was back to back to back. And, you know, these are, some days are like seven, eight hours on the bike. So I was in crazy shape and it was really hard work, but I loved it. I was, you know, biking around in the mountains. But then by the time my business became this big lumbering beast, I was spending most of my time writing shareholder reports and, you know, yeah. and cash flow reports and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, hmm, this isn't why I got into this business. And uh, I was very lucky to find a, a fantastic buyer who was really passionate about it and wanted to run with it. And he's kept it under the same brand, which is lovely. It's nice to see it in, endure. And he, um, he also, you know, I also sold it a year before COVID. And I would not have had, oh, wow. I would not have had the, the strength or the capital to be able to sustain it through COVID. And he, d- he did. He had the pockets, uh, I guess, and the wherewithal to sustain it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad it, it found the buyer that it did. The right timing. And so I guess the next venture would be Wayfinders. By the way, I love the name Wayfinders. Is that the venture that you started with the capital that you sold with? Yeah, there was, there was actually a fair bit of overlap there. Uh, I sold that business, Sacred Rides, in February of 2019. But my first Wayfinders event was September of 2017. It was never meant to be a business. It was just I was going to a lot of entrepreneur events back then. And... The, the value that I got from those events was the, was the um, connections that I made, but the, the format generally was pretty lousy for that, right? It was like a, it was very 
information based. So there was a, a speaker and then a, a workshop and then another speaker and then a networking break in the hallway. And I just wanted to create something where the focus was on connection. And I knew from you know the, the existing business that I was running that when people are outside and they're doing challenging things and they're having fun together, they tend to come together quickly. So my first event was just, let's take an adventure travel trip and let's throw in a little bit of content, you know, some peer-delivered workshops and stuff like that. And let's have lots of great meals together and stuff like that and put the focus on connection. And so that first event, I just sent out invitations to people I knew in my network. And it sold out fairly quickly. There was, I think, 19 people there. And they loved it and they asked me to do more of them. And so I decided, you know, I, and I'd kind of worked my way out of the previous business. There were other people running it. So... I, I started running more of these events, and, and then I kind of got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm really excited about this. I don't want to be distracted by two businesses, so I yeah. decided to sell the other business and, and just Perfect. go all in on Wayfinders. Perfect timing. That's awesome. So in terms of connection, I think, before we get a little deeper into Wayfinders, I just find it fascinating as a business model, but can you describe a moment or experience during your own entrepreneurial journey, so anytime before Wayfinders, that deeply impacted your understanding of the importance of connection or community or even personal authenticity. Because if you're going to start a business that is centered around the three C's, which we'll talk about, or connection, community, authenticity, there had to be moments in your life during your entrepreneurial journey that got you excited about it. Can you describe a couple of those instances? Well, probably the, I guess, most impactful, uh, I wouldn't say it was an event, it was just a, a period of my life was that, you know, that long dark night of the soul I talked about. It's it's one of the, and I, you know, I've really, really done a lot of research on human connection and um, mm. and understanding the, the neuroscience and the neurobiology of human connection, whatever. And it's one of the unfortunate aspects of depression that your your, your brain goes into kind of this fear response and wants to shut down and disconnect from other other people as a result. And that was definitely what happened with me. You know, I got into these mental feedback loops of like, you know, nobody wants to hang out with me. I'm kind of worthless as a human being. I don't, mm. even, even my close friends, I distance myself from. And so that was, and I, you know, and I told myself a very convincing story that nobody wanted to hang out with me. And so I really isolated myself. And that, that two and a half year period was by far the most disconnected, isolating period of my life and very painful. And so as I started to emerge from that, and you know, I, I emerged from it through a combination of, I finally got over the shame of taking antidepressant medication. Mm. I knew that that was not the long-term solution, but the, it was, I was so bad, there was days on end where I couldn't get out of bed I couldn't do any of the more positive things that I knew would lead to long-term health, you know, like exercise or meditation or yoga. And so when I finally committed to medication, it gave me a little bit of a foundation. I could actually get out of bed and I can go to a yoga class or I could, you know, get exercise or whatever. So I, I did all those things. And then as I started to emerge from that, you know, that fog, I, I started to become much more intentional about human connection and... I started to really prioritize it, make it a make it a priority in my life. And now, you know, to this day, I've, I've mentioned to you like about the, you know, regular connections I do with my members, many of whom I count as my friends. But that also extends to my broader friend network. I have a, you know, I have a database in Airtable of all the people that I want to stay connected with. When's the last time we connected? How do I want to connect with them? It's a core aspect of of how I spend my time and my life is connecting with other people. And that's a, you know, as I started to emerge from that dark period and becoming more intentional about connection, then it became a positive reinforcing feedback loop where I felt, I felt good being around other people and I felt nourished by being with other people. And then the better I felt, the more I wanted to connect with other people. And so it kind of reversed that negative feedback loop and turned it into a, a positive one. And then, then I started to learn the value of being able to create that for others. And so, you know, creating, I created, you know, I would, I would host people for dinner in my home and I would try and be intentional about it, about the conversations that we would have. And we would have, you know, facilitated conversations, stuff like that, that would encourage people to open up beyond just the usual small talk. And then I would host events for entrepreneurs and I, had, I hosted this dinner series 
And so, and now with Wayfinders, you know, for the members that are in Toronto, we have ongoing monthly events, dinners and outings and all kinds of stuff like that. So I guess, you know, that experience just taught me how important connection is in my life. And then I've since, you know, through going through the research, learned what happens when we are connected with other people and conversely, what happens to the brain when we're disconnected and what happens when we're chronically lonely. It's, it's, it's akin to smoking, you know, if you're chronically lonely, it's, it's, it's akin to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. That's how profound the impact is on our health. Wow. And so my work, my work is, is really about helping people restore connection in their lives, not just with other people, but also to themselves, to the natural world, to, you know, other aspects of connection. And so, you know, the big, biggest things I've learned are just, there, there are very few people in this world who are nourished by being consistently solitary. You know, maybe there's some monks, but even a lot of the monks I've met, like in Bhutan and stuff, they are very social social beings. And we as humans, for hundreds of thousands of years, have relied on other people. And our entire brain chemistry is oriented around spending time with other people. And so I try to create contexts where people can have those nourishing relationships. And I try to teach them how to be intentional about it as well and not just treat it as an accidental thing, right? Like waiting for the phone to ring. Mm -hmm. You know, we were speaking a lot about Wayfinders, but I, I don't think we ever got the 30-second elevator pitch. So before we continue on and ask more questions about the company itself and your direction there, you want to give us a 30-second elevator pitch on Wayfinders? Sure. I mean, my, my five-second pitch is I help entrepreneurs become themselves. And what I mean by that is through the process of community, through a process of personal exploration, self-reflection, and through adventure and exposure to other cultures, I help people, you know, understand who they are at their core and help them engage in a, in a dialogue with their, with their soul, so to speak, uh, for lack of a better word. And most of us, I think, spend our lives living fairly inauthentically. You know, like I told you a little bit about my university journey, which was really just responding to other voices telling me what I should do. And there's, you know, millions of doctors and lawyers in the in the world who probably don't want to be doctors and lawyers, but we've elevated those professions to such a pedestal. And I know a lot of miserable lawyers and doctors, and there are a lot of happy ones as well. But I think, you know, I, I try to help people really un uncover who they are at their core and do that not alone, but in the context of a community journey with other amazing people. And my, my customers are all entrepreneurs. And I, and I choose that because entrepreneurs, I find, are very interested in, in this journey. And they have the capacity to go on the journey and the curiosity to explore it. Yeah. And so the, the, the core of what I do is these big international adventures. I just got back from Uganda. And in October, I'm going to Western Mongolia. And I take people to really remote, faraway places because I can take them so far out of their day-to-day -day context that it's kind of jarring. And it, it sort of forces a reappraisal of who am I and, and what am I and is, and also taking people out of the dominant kind of Western narrative of how to live a human life, because it's just one story, right? But there are millions of stories around the world, different interpretations of, of how to live human life. And I find the more I can expose people to these other interpretations, that the more it's like, hmm, interesting. And just to give you one example, you know, when we were in Bhutan, we spent two nights living with the monks at this remote monastery. And they're among the, the happiest people uh, I've ever met. And their life is extremely simple. They have few possessions. They spend a lot of their day meditating. But it's a wonderful community that they live there, and they're very happy. And, you know, nobody, I, as far as I know, nobody went on that event has decided to become a monk. monk. <laughs> But I do think everybody took something away from that about the value of stillness and contemplation and not always having to be like rushing and doing and going and that there's value in sometimes just standing still and, you know, listening to the beat of your own heart. Absolutely. That's not 30 seconds. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Spirituality is definitely a hat and finding your higher self. And I think that no Ferraris and no TikTok and they're still happy, which is a great testament to the lie that society has placed on the way we present what success looks like. And I think the longer you are an entrepreneur or someone that's successful, the quicker you find out that the achievements that you make in life, the financial access that comes about from success doesn't necessarily 
allow you for fulfillment. And there are a lot of billionaires out there that are very miserable and depressed at this moment right now, which is really interesting. And a lot of very poor people in places all around the world that have, to our standards, absolutely nothing are running around with a smile on their face, which is just an interesting dynamic within this lifetime. But you know better than anyone since you've been there. But thank you for that mm-hmm. for that elevator pitch. The three C's, I think those are very important to quickly touch upon. So with Wayfinders, you have a model reflecting community, challenge, and culture, if I recall. Can you speak to those and let us know how these elements actually influenced your professional and personal development, and perhaps even other entrepreneurs. Why did you choose those three C's and and how have they been pivotal in your life? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, the the model is ever evolving and I have a whole, I really like the letter C and there's another five C's that I can talk about. We can can get to that. Uh, Those are all related to connection. But the the three C's you're referring to, it, it refers to, kind of my model of how I, how I deliver my international adventures. And so connection, challenge, and, and culture. Uh, sorry, community, challenge, and culture. And at the heart of it is, is community because I'm a strong believer in community, right? This, this, um, this whole idea of independence and kind of going it alone and the hero up against all odds by him or herself, that's a very recent phenomenon. You know, like, like I said, we humans, it, you know, you don't have to go back very far to an era where humans really, really depended on each other, right? And if you go back 10,000 years and you were trying to go it alone, you would you would die. You relied on other people. Yep. And that's how we've evolved. And our brains have not evolved past that. Our neurochemistry relies on other uh, other people. And I think there's just something, and we've, we've gotten away from, from really valuing community. And, mm-hmm. you know, this whole idea of the nuclear family kind of living it alone. You know, w- when I was in Uganda, it was incredible to watch how kids are raised there and it's and it's really like no other place emblematic of that saying it takes a village to raise a child and the, the children are not just the responsibility of the parents it's like all the people around them who are caring for these children and if a particular parent can't do it on a, another day somebody else is going to step in and it's yeah. just a wonderful way of everybody kind of looking after each other and i really want to help restore you know the sense that help is not a four letter word that asking for help is uh, is a natural part of being a human and, and get away from this fetishizing of doing everything uh, on our own. And so really restoring that sense of community in the world. And, and hopefully if I do that well, people, you know, they bring that back to their neighborhoods. And, you know, I want to start a community organization in my, in my neighborhood, or maybe it's at work, when people understand the value of community and connection. Culture is the other aspect of it. And I touched on, you know, this idea. Culture is just different interpretations of how, of how to live life and what's valuable. And there are vastly different interpretations, right, from from Uganda or from, you know, we're going to be spending time with the nomads of Western Mongolia. That interpretation of how to live a meaningful life is very different. For them, it's it's all about a deep connection to the land and to their animals and moving with the seasons and very much moving with the rhythms of the earth. And, And so exposure to those different cultures is something that people can bring bring home with them, right? Like the value of stillness that we brought home from Bhutan and from the nomads, undoubtedly, uh, you know, I hope people will come back with, with a sense that connecting to the land and connecting to the natural world is really important. And so all of these are hopefully little ideas that people can take to inform their lives, to get out of this just one, you know, narrative that we've been fed. And then challenge is the other part of it. And so with my, you know, my events can be pretty challenging, Uganda is probably, you know, my most challenging event. We, you know, one of the, the hikes that we did was up to a 14,000 foot volcano up these rickety ladders and all, you know, all this kind of stuff. But, and it's not just physical challenge, but also emotional and spiritual challenge. And I sort of look at it as a model of there's our, our comfort zone that we spend most of our time in. There's not a lot of growth that happens there. And beyond that is the, the stretch zone. And that's where I want to, you know, kind of push people into their stretch zone. And, but if I push people too far, then they end up in their panic zone and then they contract. So I'm trying to get people in their stretch zone. And one of the things about when you stretch that comfort zone, it kind of tends to be a permanent expansion, right? And so when you push yourself physically and push through, you know, when every voice in your brain is saying, stop, this is too hard, or I can't move or whatever, and you just push through that. And ideally, you push through that with the support of some other people around you, and it becomes the shared experience. And... You can, you can hopefully take that to other areas of your life where like, 
hey, I encountered a boundary and I, and I just stuck with it and I pushed through it. And that becomes a new belief system. Uh, and so those are, those are the, the different you know, aspects that, kind of, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that goes on with my events, but those are kind of the three main threads that weave throughout and how, uh, how I try to create you know, an impactful experience for people. You know, continuing with the third C challenge, Obviously, entrepreneurship is a challenging and unpredictable journey. When you're going on these events, sometimes for the first time yourself, how do you navigate through the unpredictable nature of what is to come? You're now in charge of a a whole bunch of other entrepreneurs, as well as now you're dealing with external forces, but also with their own internal issues that come up. I'm sure out of every 10 entrepreneurs, you have at least one or two that break down and lose it every single trip. And then there are others who probably jump in and as a tribe heal, right? Mm-hmm. But how do you overcome these obstacles? How, what, what are the lessons that not only you attain from these experiences, but also your entrepreneurs? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. I mean, this, this is all a, a learning and a growth journey for me as well, right? As a, as a host and a facilitator. And so I'm always trying to push my boundaries of, of my own comfort zone. And a lot of that for me has been just trusting that I know what I'm doing because it's very easy to, you know, I'll, I'll come up with an idea and then a little, little voice of doubt comes in. It's like, no, you can't do that. That's too crazy or, or you're not skilled enough to do that or whatever. And so a lot of that journey for me has been learning to trust in my instincts and, and my own skills and my experience. You know, it, it, is, it is quite a journey and everybody has a different journey and people encounter different limits. And if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm not pushing people to the point where they encounter those limits, I'm kind of doing them a disservice because then they're just staying in that comfort zone. And, yeah. um, and so my goal is to try and push everyone, whether, you know, whether it's physically or mentally or emotionally, spiritually, whatever, out of their comfort zones. You sort of touched on this idea of tribe, right? It's like most of my events now are typically 80% or higher returning returning members. And so there's kind of a, an ongoing family aspect to it. And they're very good at wel- welcoming new people into the fold. And just, I spent a lot of time creating an atmosphere of psychological safety where people can come and just feel like they can be themselves, they can be vulnerable, they can be open. And there's various techniques I use for that. Storytelling is probably the number one technique I use. And when, when you can get, when you give people an invitation to tell a story, then people can connect on that very human level, right? Because humans have told stories for hundreds of thousands of years. Of course. And then you, you can immediately form these very deep connections. And then people look after each other. And so then it's not you know, relying on me and my skills as a facilitator when somebody is having a, a breakdown. There's always, there's always a breakdown. And you know, one of the other ways I describe what I do is I, I say I take entrepreneurs to faraway places and I make them cry. <laughs> and uh, which is which is pretty much accurate, right? Uh, every event there's lots of tears, but I'm trying to I'm trying to you know crack people open so they can like be honest with what's going on in their lives and not you know not work their way past it or drink their way past it or whatever, and create an opening for them to be vulnerable about that and to tap into that. And that you know often will result in tears. But you know when somebody does break down in tears, that resonates with other other people. And, and then that's often where other people will come in for support. And so it's not just reliant on me to hold those people and, and hold space for them, but the whole community does that. And then it also creates something beautiful, right? When somebody has that moment of rawness and vulnerability and the community yeah. just responds and offers their support, it also just creates an additional safety and an additional opening for other people who are maybe holding something back and they're not sure, like, is this the right place where I can talk about this? And for a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they don't, they have places to talk about their business and their marketing and all that kind of stuff, but they don't necessarily have places to talk about, you know, their struggles with their relationships or their mental well-being or, you know, their, their company's on the verge of collapsing or whatever. And so when I, when I create that opening and, and people kind of feel, okay, it's safe, safe for me to, to walk through that door, it's like a breath of fresh air. And it's like, hey, I can actually talk to somebody about you know, these very real and very difficult things that I'm going through. And, and then what we find, what I find, you know, there's only so many human stories. You know, if, if I share a story of my dad passing when I was 16, your father may not have passed away, but you can resonate to that sense of loss, you know, as uh, your friend who committed suicide. And those are incredible points of connection for, 
for people those stories and and that's how the community holds itself yeah vulnerability is such a powerful emotion and a lot of people don't they underestimate it they feel that it shows weakness but it's really the opposite i think the ones that try to pretend that they know it all have it all that they don't have imposter syndrome are the ones that no one really resonates with and the ones that really attach themselves to the effort of honesty and vulnerability shine through every single time. I see it all the time, especially on social media as well. So in terms of imposter syndrome, seems like you mentioned it a few times. How do you deal with it? I mean, I think I think I've gotten pretty good at dealing with it now. I, I just I I had that at various times. Various times, usually it was because I didn't have faith in my skills as a facilitator or a host. Because you know, if I'm creating an environment for people to explore these very difficult themes or you know important themes in their lives, that I have to tre- tread that very carefully, and so. In the early days, I, I often imposter syndrome would show up. Like I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to do this work. And if it, things get too difficult, am I going to be able to, to deal with that? Mm-hmm. I guess you know my response to that has been, a to increase my level of training. So I've done a lot of facilitation training, because I want to develop the skills to be able to, mm-hmm. to, to hold these these spaces, and then b just trusting in myself and trusting in my own intuition. And a lot of that is just like, you know, trusting down here, trusting my heart rather than getting stuck in my head. Because my head, mm-hmm. you know, my inner critic resides in my head and it'll tell me, tell me things like, no, no, you, you can't do this or you can't do that. And, and I had an interesting experience in the Amazon. I, I led an event in the Peruvian Amazon in November of 2021. One of the things I did on that event is I took people out into the jungle and I, I left people... I, took everybody to their own kind of solitary spot in the jungle where they couldn't see or hear anybody else. And I left them there for two hours. I didn't tell them how long I was going to leave them. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, just sit here and, and there's no objective. Just sit here and see what happens. You know, they didn't have phones, they didn't have journals or anything. The goal of that was to, A, instill the value of, of stillness to them and the, the, the value in kind of just listening you know, listening to your own heart or listening to your own soul or whatever you want to call it, but also developing a more intimate connection with, with the natural world. Anyway, so I, I, I always partake in the exercises that I lead my group through. And so I went and found my own spot in the jungle. And I sat there. And after about an hour, maybe an hour, 20 minutes, something like that, there's this little voice in the back of my head saying, surrender. And I, I wrestled with that for about 10 minutes, like, surrender to what? And then this other voice saying, you know, trust. I was like, trust, trust in what? Trust in whom? And eventually the, the answer that came to me was just surrender to the jungle. And then the next question was like, well, what, what, the, what the hell does that mean? And, uh, and the, finally the answer came, just lie down. And so I was, I, was in, I was in a t-shirt. And this is the Amazon jungle. And this, is, you know, one, this particular area was one of the most biodiverse parts of the Amazon jungle with lots of really, really gnarly insects, including... Uh, what's called the bullet ant, which is uh, the most painful yes. bite of any you know creature on earth. Yes, and the the, mm-hmm. the jungle was telling me lie down, and every instinct was like that is the craziest idea in the world. You were gonna you were gonna get overrun with bullet ants, and you're gonna die from you know banana spiders or whatever. And the voice just kept coming, and it kept just saying trust and surrender. And so after about ten minutes of wrestling with that, I just laid down, and I laid down on the forest floor for half an hour in my t-shirt. And nothing happened. I didn't get any. I mean, I got some like little, you know, little tiny bites, whatever. But I just sort of sank into that experience. And then I, I actually felt myself at one point just kind of merge with the forest around me as if there wasn't any separation between. It was somewhat akin to a psychedelic experience, minus the psychedelics. Wow. And that to me was a really good lesson in just trusting, trusting, trusting that the universe has my has my back. And then also just trusting in myself. And since that day, you know, when I come up with an idea for an exercise that I want to lead the group through or an experience we want to have, 
if I, if I can tap into that and feel like, where is that coming from? Is that coming from my head or is that coming from my heart? If I can sense that, that it's coming from a, a, a really a deeper place, then I will trust that instinct and I will go with it. Even if my head is like, that is really stupid or that's really risky. And also to be clear, like I am extremely safety conscious, right? And, and I develop backup plans on top of backup plans. And, you know, I don't, I don't just do random crazy shit without thinking about the consequences or risk mitigation or any of that. So that's where the head comes in. But if I trust the heart and I, and I go with that first instinct, usually it's a good one and people get a lot of value out of, out of what we're doing. I interviewed my spiritual teacher, Atmananda Das, a while back, and we were talking about ego. And one of the main components to an entrepreneur, it's just humans in general, but I'm just going to focus on entrepreneurs, is that ego just jumps right in front of them. And they believe that they're the ones in control, that they're the ones that need to push forward, that it's all up to them. And that's their demise. Because... The antidote to the ego, as he so boldly claimed, is humility. I'm not in control, as you mentioned, and that I have to surrender to my journey and my experience in this lifetime. And maybe something that I believe needs to happen might be coming from the ego instead of from the divine or from my soul to what my experience should be. It just speaks exactly to that surrendering part of your experience. I think that's a wise lesson for all entrepreneurs. There was many nuggets in this conversation so far, but surrender, humility, it's something that I'm working on constantly. And my wife is my greatest teacher in that. She keeps on telling me, stop being so arrogant, find -hmm. your humility. And I think that's just a natural tendency of being an entrepreneur, which is an alpha male or a leader, you tend to want to lead with ego and you got to step back for the most exceptional entrepreneurs out <laughs> there. That's what you should do. What is the one habit that you believe contributed to all your success throughout these years? I mean, if, if I were to look back at my previous business, I certainly had all the trappings of conventional success. You know, we got lots of media attention, the, the business expanded rapidly. We, I don't particularly, you know, from my current vantage point, I don't see that as very successful because it was very much driven by what you just touched on, ego. And that that word ego is, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can unpack it. But really, for me, it was just a, a quest for validation to get validation that I, you know, maybe didn't receive as a child or, or whatever. It was this hungry quest. I needed I needed people to validate me and tell me I was good enough and worthy enough. And, you know, my goal was I wanted to get on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. And I felt that that would would validate me. And and looking back, it's like, oh my God, what the heck? And I reached a point, there, there there was two kind of seminal moments in that journey that, you know, eventually led me to the decision to sell that company and get and get out. One was uh, reading the book, Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. And I read that book and it was like, you know, getting run over by a truck is like, oh my God, this is, this is me to a T. And the second one was um, a fellow who's now a friend of mine, Philip McKernan. He kind of does, you know, retreats and stuff similar, similar to me, but he's very direct and very like cuts to the bone. And I was at a session of his that he did in California and, and he asked the question of where are you seeking validation? And I reflected on that and I wrote about it and I, and I realized, you know, a, a lot of the validation I was seeking was from my father, whom I was never going to get his validation. He's been long yep. passed away. And then also from my mother. And I realized, like, and that a lot of my, you know, business striving was related to that and that that was a, a fool's errand and that I would never get, you know, no matter how big my company got or no matter how many covers I would, I was on, that would not lead to what I was looking for. And so when I started this business, I, I, I started from a very different place. And, and there was incidents along the way that helped me, you know, really work with ego and not necessarily, you know, dissolve it or, or get rid of it, but like acknowledge it. And then, and then I can say, oh, thank you. You know, thank you for your input. We're going to listen to, you know, a different speaker today. And so I've approached this business very differently, where I I don't feel the need to scale this business all over the world. I want to have an impact on a small community of people, but I want to have a deep impact on them. And I want to approach it from a a place of service. And I want to, I want to keep it service foremost. And, and that's been my guiding light, my North Star, if you will, is just about service to the community. 
And interestingly enough, my you know my business is just, is is doing far better than my my old business ever was, despite you know having investor money and all you know all this and tons of marketing, whatever. I don't do any marketing for this company. That's the approach that I want to keep taking with business for the rest of my life. Is approaching it from a, a place of you know humility and deep service to the the people that I'm serving, and it allows you know I and I charge a lot of money for my events. I don't do that because I want to earn you know ungodly amounts of money i do it because i can run two events a year and i can put my heart and soul into them and into the community i don't have to take on other work and i can focus deeply on this work in the community and and i'm well compensated for it i live a, a good life i can take care of my you know my family i can do work that's meaningful to me i can not overwork and i can you know take care of myself and so that to me you know is a feels like a, a a valuable uh, star to orient myself around that value of service. Bravo. That's just an incredible response and just insight into what's possible. Speaking of family, as you just mentioned, you're an adventurer, a writer, an entrepreneur. How do you manage to find balance between pursuing your passions and fulfilling your responsibilities as a father and a husband? Yeah. I, I mean, to be honest, the, the, you know, the time away when I'm running my events, that's difficult. It's usually I'm away for about two weeks at a time and my wife is left on her own with three kids, hmm. but that's only, that's really only twice a year. The rest of the time I'm, I'm here and I'm fully present. I hired a full-time assistant back in end of March, I want to say something like that. But even before that, I never really worked more than 20, 25 hours a week. I actually, I actually started with, you know, when I, when, I, when I decided to turn Wayfinders into a proper company, I started with the end goal in mind. I said, okay, I want to run two events a year. This is how much I want to make to be able to look after my family. How many people do I need per event? And what do I need to charge them to be able to do that? And so I kind of reverse engineered that. Mm-hmm. And which ended up, you know, with a company that I only need about 25 people per event, two events a year, and earn a, a nice living. And so consequently, I don't have to hustle hard to do sales or marketing. I also decided to start with the perspective I'd, I don't want to have, uh, I don't want to have any staff. And so for five years, up until I ran, you know, hired my assistant, I, I just ran it on my own. And even then, it was only 20, 25 hours a week. Now it's more like 10 hours a week because she handles all the stuff you know, the admin stuff and whatnot. And so I narrowed it down to, I want to, I want to be able to write, I want to be able to design and host events, and I want to connect with my members. And that's, that's pretty much it. You know, it's now 20 to 3. My kids will be coming through the door. My, my work day is done. Most days I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fully available when my kids come home. So, I, you know, I feel very blessed. Other than the time that I'm away, which is, uh, and we're working trying to, you know, figure that out to make it easier on my wife, but I'm hoping my eldest is now 15. Mm-hmm. It's not far off that I could, you know, that I could bring her along and she could be my assistant. And I know she would love that and I would love that. And I think, you know, it probably work better when she's 16 or 17 at least, but I, more and more I want to try and in- integrate my family into my work life. You know, to give you an example, in December and January, we were, we did a four week family trip through Vietnam and Laos. Wow. And that Laos trip, even though it was mostly a family trip, there's a little bit of like scouting around and checking out different venues and stuff like that. And it's a beautiful, spectacular country. And I identified a few places that I, that I want to use. And so I'm running an event there next October, October 2024. And that event sold out in like three weeks. And so that's, you know, just trying to bring my family into my work life a little bit more. And so I, I just feel deeply blessed to, you know, be where I'm at today to not have to hustle too hard and, and to be able to do the work that I do. So it's, uh, it's not much of a struggle. I don't miss much in terms of my kids' lives. We're blessed to have you on the show and impart these wisdom nuggets throughout this hour. I'd like to close out my interviews with the following question. Who did you have to stop being and who did you need to become to manifest your current success? Mm. Well, it's a good question to kind of tie up all these themes that we talked about. I think the big, the biggest thing, and this, you know, came came about through just a, a process of being, you know, getting an uppercut or two from the universe, a cosmic <laughs> punch in the face, and my own personal work that takes many different forms these days. But really, being able to to 
abandon that, that really ego-driven quest for validation and really just being able to find validation for myself and a comfort level and acceptance of myself and who I am, you know, getting to that place meant a totally different approach to my business, which I've touched, touched on, and, and discovering how much more fulfilling and how much more gratifying it is to come at work from a place of service than a place of validation. And sometimes, sometimes like I, I find myself like questioning myself because I, I feel like, I, I often feel like th there's, there's really not a lot of ego at, at play. And then, I'm, then I question that. It's like, really? Like, did you actually really leave that behind? Or are you just bullshitting yourself? Like, and, and I think the answer, I think the answer is truly no. Like, I, I, don't, I don't need any validation. You know, you and I, I, I reached out to you not because I, I, I want the validation of being on your podcast and having your listeners you reach out to me or whatever. It's because I think I have something valuable to share and I like your message and I want, and I want to reach your listeners with that same message. And, you know, I don't care if, like, you, you, you hide my name and my company or whatever and alter my voice or whatever. It's really not about me. And I hope, and I hope that I'm not <laughs> deluding myself about that. But being able to move from that, that place of, of ego-based ego strivings to uh, a place where it's really just about service to others is such a gratifying place to be. And that's, you know, that's who I think I had to become, a, a little bit more selfless and and a, and a little bit more outwardly focused, which is which is it, which is ironically in the end a much more self nourishing place to be, and it is uh, ultimately more selfish because it 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 fills me up way more than anything else that I've done. Thank you for that. That's great for me. Speaking of validation, I think for any entrepreneur, that comes front and center with starting a business and wanting to be on the cover of magazines and be well known. I, and I was designing magazines in Photoshop with my product or photo in time. And you're right, it all fizzles away because as you age and as you get wiser, <laughs> you realize that it's not about being validated. It's about mattering to the world around you. Everybody wants to matter. That's what I think humans have in common is that ultimate ability to belong to the community and that's what you've been building and it's funny because i made a connection no pun intended <laughs> your parents being immigrants to your father passing when you were young to your need of validation and loneliness and mental health issues that you faced throughout your early years as a result, probably because of the lack of a father figure. That is a very impactful aspect to somebody's life. But I know that your dad was looking down at you because he allowed you to create a company called Wayfinders, and you're finding your way throughout with that company. You're finding your way throughout the loneliness and the validation and the ego and everything that we come here as humans to learn over time. This lifetime, a hundred lifetimes from now, these are the lessons. It's not who dances best on TikTok. It's not who has the largest golden yacht, but it's the one that can spend time with someone who has a golden yacht and spend time with someone who has nothing and see them in the same light. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, for providing your knowledge and passions with us. Why don't you tell us where the Seven Hatters can connect with you and potentially even go on these life-changing adventures with you because I've looked at these adventures and I'm like, <laughs> I got to participate one of these days. So you might have me in your group, but tell us where we can find you. So the Wayfinders website is way-finders.com, W-A-Y-finders.com. Uh, also, I do a lot of writing on Substack, so wayfinders.substack.com. Uh, I kind of took a break with, with Uganda and whatnot, but I'm gonna, I have a bunch of stuff that I'm going to start putting out there, and that's just a lot of my writing around human connection and, and different things there. So those are the two best places. Awesome. 
Mike, thank you so much for gracing us on the Seven Hats. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mike. Let's end today with a show segment that I refer to as, What Can We Hang Our Hat On? And here is my takeaway. Mike highlighted a powerful transition in his life. The shift from egocentric pursuits to dedicating his life to service of others. It's a transformation that's not just impactful, but profoundly enriching, offering a sense of fulfillment that often eludes those locked in the pursuit of self-interest. Now, you may ask why? Why is the act of serving others so nourishing to our souls? Well, Mike offers an insight that's both deep and paradoxical. It's in the act of giving that we receive the most. As we extend our hands to help others, it's often our hearts that become filled with joy, purpose, and a deep understanding of our own humanity. So, this thought leads us to a crucial question. How can each of us pivot from a self-focused perspective to a more outward, service-oriented one? It's a challenge that calls us not just to think differently, but to live differently. It nudges us to explore how we can contribute to the world around us and how we can leverage our skills, our passions, and our resources to make a difference. To all you seven hatters out there, as you go about your day, your week, your life, remember this, our true fulfillment often resides not in the things that we can accumulate, but in the blessings that we bestow upon others. It's the gifts we offer, the service we render, the love we share, that ultimately defines the richness of our lives. In this journey of life, as we strive to find our way, we may become wayfinders, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. That's the essence of the wayfinders mission that Mike embodies, and it's a goal we can all aspire to. So contemplate on this as we part ways today. I wanna thank Mike once again for joining me so that we can all benefit from his wisdom. And until next time, if you found this episode helpful, please hit that subscribe button and tell other entrepreneurs out there what value you receive from it so that we can attract even more high quality people into our 7 Hats community. So for now, I will bid you farewell and success on your journey. And until next time, my name is Yuval Selleck and I tip my hat to you.